Hello, everyone. So thank you for coming for this last seminar. <laughs> and please maybe look to the, to, the, to the people who are going to talk and not only on your computer. <laughs> Uh, so today we have the chance to have Victoria and Pablo presenting uh, two different works. Uh, so they are actually PhD, uh, postdoctoral students, no, not students, postdoctoral researchers at the University of Zaragoza in Spain. So Victoria is going to talk about text-dependent uh, face on speaker biometric systems and Pablo is going to present uh, audio segmentation on noise and music uh, multi-class segmentation, so topics that are highly related with uh, our research topic of the result. So yes, thank you. So thank you, Marie, and um, hello, everyone. As most of you already know, my name is Victoria Mingote. I'm a postdoctoral researcher since one year ago from the University of Zaragoza. And in this talk, I'm going to explain uh, several interesting approaches, well, just uh, an overview of them, that I carry out during, during my PhD, in which these uh, approaches are focused on two main streams of research for face and speaker biometric systems. The first part of uh, this talk is about representation learning, and the second one is, is based on different metric learning approaches. But, uh, there, uh, but before to start with them, I'm going to briefly explain uh, the motivation and how began this work. Nowadays, as already you know, biometric recognition systems have uh, become a crucial part of our daily lives, uh, using them for different applications. The expansion of these kind of systems uh, has uh, promoted a great development of the technology behind them, especially with the spread of uh, AI algorithms. However, there is still some issues that has uh, to solve when it has problems, uh, when limited data is available, and uh, when we want to transfer techniques from a specific task to another one. This last issue was, uh, was the starting point of this work, uh, because at the beginning uh, we developed several phase verification systems using this typical structure ba uh, uh, of systems based on DNNs. To evaluate these systems, uh, we uh, employ a, sma a small video data set called Mobio data set, where we achieve uh, good uh, performance, especially when we increase the number of layers. So in view of these uh, results, and also we, we knew that for test independent speaker verification systems, uh, similar architectures were used successfully, we decided to introduce uh, them to create a text dependent speaker verification system. At this point, I want to make an important remark because uh, you are all uh, are familiar with the speaker verification, but uh, probably the speaker verification that you have in mind uh, are test independent. So I mean, in this kind of systems, uh, the target person can say any sentence and the, syst uh, and the system grant the access. Nevertheless, in the case of test dependent speaker verification, uh, a, fi a fixed passphrase has to be pronounced by the speaker uh, to grant the access. So in any other case, uh, the system has to deny the, the access to the system. So this uh, protocol has a, an advantage that it gives more security to the system, but also has the disadvantage that is more complicated to get this kind of data. So therefore, uh, coming, uh, coming back to the previous uh, archi architecture, we did some uh, modifications over it to use for test-dependent speaker verification systems. And uh, we evaluate the performance uh, of our systems using a text-dependent speaker verification dataset, which is called RSR 2015, and also note that is the dataset is quite small. So here we can observe uh, the results that we achieved where uh, we found that uh, these uh, ki kind of approaches uh, perform, uh, um, do not perform well for these tasks, regardless of the network depth. So uh, we say this since we knew that uh, for this data set, traditional approaches as HMMs or GMMs exceed uh, equal error rates values, error, the lower the better, around 1%.
So when you have a basic uh, speaker verification system, I know what equal error rate means. It means you have equal numbers of uh, false rejections and false acceptance. But here there are two kinds of false acceptances, right? You might accept the correct speaker saying a wrong phrase or an incorrect speaker. Both. Both. So do you know the breakdown? I mean, is, if what makes, which is the harder of the two? Is it, for example, which is harder, the correct speaker saying the wrong passphrase or the uh, imposter saying the correct passphrase? I guess we don't analyze specific the numbers. Okay. <laughs> the, the owner of the database can answer the question. Yeah, actually, I've, I've been working a bit on this on the topic. Uh, actually, it's more it's usually more difficult. Well, it depends on the system you're using first, of course. If the more ASR you put in, the easier it is to discriminate between one speaker pronouncing two sentences. But usually for speaker verification, all the systems we're using are better at discriminating between different speakers than different text. And uh, but definitely the most difficult is the same speaker pronouncing something different or something even close. But also, I'm going to show an, an illustration now that shows a cosine similarity matrix where we analyze a bit this, but not with numbers, just in a illustration. So. Hence, uh, we decide to make a deeper analysis of what might be happening, and we compute, an, uh, as I was mentioning, and uh, depict the cosine similarity matrix of two different speakers uh, pronouncing uh, different phrases. So in this uh, figure, we observe that in the diagonal, we have uh, high cosine values, for uh, which uh, uh, shows the, the same speaker pronouncing a different, different phrase has a good behavior. But uh, in the other hand, we also have uh, a high similarity between different speakers pronounce uh, the same phrase. So this could be one of the reasons uh, between the others that Anthony mentioned uh, about the poor performance of the system. So uh, once we did uh, this uh, analysis, we conclude that a possible uh, cause of the previous inaccuracy could be derived from the use of the global average pooling that is usual to use in this kind of systems to obtain the, representation, the final representation of the uterus. Since uh, this uh, pooling mechanism uh, uh, mainly mm, keeps the, the information of who is speaking and it may not capture correctly the phonetic information. So therefore, uh, the, the order of the phonetic information may be neglect and this is a relevant part uh, in the identity information, uh, as I mentioned, for the test-dependent speaker verification uh, process. So, to solve uh, this problem, we propose to replace the global average pooling by, uh, with a, a differentiable alignment mechanism where the alignment matrices are obtained externally where, uh, the, with the information of the similarity between the different frames, time frames. And after that, uh, can be included as a, an, an internal layer, uh, a new internal layer in the system. The combination of the DNN uh, with this um, new mechanism uh, allows the, to keep the temporal structure of the, of the uterans. And also, uh, thanks to the use of this alignment mechanism, the, the architecture is able to encode the, the phrase and speaker uh, information in a, in a representation vector which has a similar uh, behavior as the uh, super vectors in the um, traditional speaker verification. And also, um, we, can, we can use different alignment techniques, but in this world we use uh, HMMs and GMMs. Therefore, here we, we saw the, the architecture was, uh, was proposed, which includes a phonetic uh, alignment mechanism as a key component uh, to obtain this representation vector instead of using the global average pulley. And this new approach was tested uh, with the, using the same data set as I already mentioned. And uh, here, apart from the numerical results in terms of equal error rate, uh, I think it's more interesting to see these uh, representations that we did uh, of the global uh, average embeddings and the neural network supervectors in a two-dimensional space. So in this first figure, uh, we, we represent the global uh, average embeddings, and we can observe that uh, it's, uh, it's not able to separate uh, the representations uh, of these of this kind of representations. 
Yes. Uh, well, 30 uh, degrad, uh, colors, not only one for each speaker inside of the... Uh, So while uh, in the case of we included this uh, alignment uh, mechanism, we observed that uh, a huge decrease in the equal error rate is achieved. And also we observe uh, pretty well it, it's, cla it's cluster of these 30 phrases. And then the, sp the speakers inside of each cluster is a different uh, color also in the same uh, tonality. So uh, on the other hand, during these uh, different experiments that we carry out uh, during the previous uh, systems, apart from the issue that I already mentioned about the phonetic information, we found that uh, another uh, there are still some problems in these kind of systems when limited uh, training data is available, such in, uh, uh, in RSR 2015, such as the lack of ability to properly generalize to unseen data and the overconfident predictions produced. So to address this problem, it has been um, uh, proposed different alternatives. One approach uh, to solve this problem is, mm, is uh, the use of an architecture which follows the philosophy of knowledge distillation. This approach consists on two, on two training, two neural networks uh, where the, teach, the student network is trained to mimic the target predictions from the teacher network using the callback labor divergence. An important point to remark here is that um, in most of the previous works that we found uh, with this philosophy, the teacher network is pre-trained and the weights are frozen so to reduce the complexity of the model. But therefore, the student has to learn during all the training process the, from the same uh, labels, fixed labels. Uh, however, in this, in this work, we propose a slightly modified approach of the knowledge distillation uh, in which the teacher network is trained at the same time as the student network. Besides, uh, we add in some noise at the input to give more variability to the, the different input signals. And in this case, we uh, use the random erasing technique for this. And therefore, with this uh, new approach, uh, the teacher network produces different, um, different prediction labels during the training progresses. So, uh, and it allows to better capture the variability on these labels for the, teacher, the student network. So now here we can see this uh, architecture with the two neural networks, the, where the teacher network is trained to, mm, to, to strain as usual using the cross-entropy loss, uh, where, uh, while the student network is trained to minimize the difference between the, the prediction labels from the teacher network and the student, label, la the student prediction labels. So we evaluated here and, and see the, the how this uh, teacher-student architecture uh, behaves using it with the alignment mechanisms of the HMMs and GMMs. And we observe also a huge uh, a relevance improvement when we combine it with the GMM alignment mechanism, which is a more flexible approach. So motivated by all the problems that I already mentioned several times, <laughs> we follow looking for, uh, for other alternatives to use uh, to solve them uh, without the need of an external alignment mechanism. So um, we propose <coughs> the introduction of the multi hef self-attention uh, mechanism, which uh, exploits uh, the, the phonetic knowledge needed for the, the text-dependent speaker verification. So moreover, uh, the, this mechanism uh, is based on multiple pro dot product attention that uh, which are doing in parallel. So therefore, uh, with uh, its head is focused on different, um, on different positions of the sequence and provide uh, different relevance to, to some uh, parts of them to discriminate better between speakers and uterans. And also mention that uh, once this, um, this multi-head self-attention layer is applied, a feed-forward usually is, is applied uh, to transform and process the vectors before the next uh, dot product attention layer. Uh, nevertheless, in our pro architecture, we propose to replace uh, this feed-forward layer uh, by memory layers, with, um, which um, allows to improve the model capacity with an insignificant computational overcoast, overhead. Sorry, 
and uh, this is this is possible since uh, this kind of layers are able to store the knowledge that the network is, is learning during the training process. So therefore, uh, you, oh, I, I lost some missing parts. <laughs> And therefore, using this architecture with the approaches explained um, just before, uh, we achieve a promising uh, result thanks to the powerful of the self-attention mechanism without the need of including any external, external alignment mechanism. Despite, despite, of using a, despite that this kind of, uh, of approach usually use a global average pooling to obtain the final representation vector, uh, which has some problems, as I already mentioned, so we propose one step more to address this issue. And uh, we introduce uh, a learnable vector uh, known as class token to introduce uh, this uh, vector into the previous uh, architecture. Uh, we have uh, the class token is concatenated before the input of the first MCA layer. And the, the state at the output of this class token is the, is the vector that is employed to perform the class prediction. So with this approach, the self-attention is forced to capture uh, the most relevant information uh, with the class token uh, simulating as a, a, a global utterance descriptor similar to the super vector approach that I mentioned at the beginning, since um, the matrix of self-attention uh, weights plays a role similar to the alignment matrix in the alignment mechanism. So uh, motivated uh, by the success of the teacher-student uh, sons preview, we present a new approach introducing this teacher-student uh, combined with the last uh, uh, approaches the of MCA and, uh, and the tokens. To test this new approach, we use the same dat data set as previously, and also we introduce a larger date, a new uh, test-dependent data set, which is larger, we, uh, and called DeepMind. And in both cases, we, we can know that uh, relative improvement achieved is, is relevant when we use these tokens instead of using the global average pooling. In view of the relevant results obtained, we also conduct an analysis to explain where the matrix of attention uh, of these uh, tokens is focusing on these two uterans, of which are the same phrase pronounced by different speakers. So uh, in there are in the first row, there are the two uterans, and the second one are the uh, self-attention weights, and the third one are the sum of the previous uh, attention weights. So note that uh, since these um, figures are of the same phrase, and self-attention is focused the, the, the same, uh, is focused on the same areas, but different relevance is given to, to, to each of them. And moreover, um, we can also see that the weights, uh, uh, the weights do not pay attention to the areas at the beginning and at the end of the sentence, which corresponds with moments of silence. So and this is the end of the first part. So along the first part of this talk, uh, the different uh, representation learning approaches that I presented uh, were trained using the traditional cross-ethnopy laws. However, in the second part uh, of, this, uh, of this talk, I'm going to present three new loss functions oriented to the goal task uh, that we develop in this work. So we're mentioning here that uh, ideally uh, verification systems based on DNNs should be end-to-end -to, -end to, uh, to carry directly the verification process as a binary classification. Uh, nowadays, existing a few approaches with this uh, philosophy, but uh, in, many, in many of the current systems, as we did in our previous systems, uh, the usual way to work is training a DNN for multi-class classification, and after that, the backend is applied over on the, on the embeddings. So one of the most uh, common backend is a triplet neural network. And this kind of network is composed by three instances of the same net with shared parameters. And also it's important the way to select the, the, the input to this kind of approach. So because you have to select an, an example of, the, on a, of, of an specific class, which is called anchor, another example from the, the same class, this is a positive example, and the third one from, the ne uh, from a different class, so it's the negative. And in most of the system, uh, systems with this kind of approach, the cost function employed is the triplet loss. 
Uh, nevertheless, this loss is not oriented to the goal task. For that reason, we propose an alternative uh, to that. So to make the training procedure more consistent uh, with the final evaluation procedure, we, we propose an approximation of the AUC loss. And this metric can be expressed as we can see uh, with uh, using the one logic function. But uh, also, uh, this metric can also be expressed using the, the unit step function. However, um, this function is not differentiable, so we have to make an effective approximation to enable the backpropagation of the gradients during the training process. So uh, we substitute uh, the unit step by a sigmoid fun function which is differentiable. So this approximation, approximation allows us to include this uh, new loss function for the, tri the triplet neural network instead of using the previous uh, triplet loss. And as I mentioned in the previous slide, also it is important the way to select the, the triplets to train a good, uh, a good system. So uh, we also include in this uh, work a, a smart uh, strategy sele selection, which is called hard negative mining selection. Uh, this intelligent uh, selection process involves the selection of the, the mm, anchor negative and anchor positive pairs more complicated to determine correctly by the network. So uh, here is the system developed uh, to evaluate the effectiveness of this new loss function, where it's composed of two different architectures. The first one that is I presented in the first part of the talk. And uh, once this architecture is trained, we introduce the backend part. In there. So as we did in the, in the first part, uh, we, de we depict the, these representations in a two-dimensional space to analyze the effect of applying now the backend. So here we can observe the same two representations that I saw at the, in the first part. And in this uh, surf figure, we, we saw that the ability to discriminate uh, is even better when we apply our triplet neural network uh, with the, the AUC loss proposed. So apart from applying it for test-dependent speaker verification tasks, this approach was also applied for the face verification task. So here, uh, as in the case of the speaker verification, we use a similar architecture and we evaluate it using a mobile data set again. So uh, these results confirm the conclusions that we extracted in the previous task, uh, where um, we, can, we can see that how the applying this backend improves, uh, the, improves the, per the whole performance in all the, the different data and with both architectures that we use. And finally, after probing the access X of this proposed backend um, for speaker and face verification, we also uh, introduced it, uh, this approach in the language recognition task to discriminate better between uh, similar languages. So here we can see a, a, a recap of the results of the backend using the language recognition evaluation data sets. And we saw that the, is, uh, the results are improving in two of the three data sets, uh, especially when smart training strategies are applied. So we can conclude from this uh, part, uh, this work that we did here, that it can, it can be applied for different uh, verification tasks and other tasks, as Pablo mentioned later. So uh, the previous AUC loss uh, it has shown that this is a, a good choice to improve the, the overall system performance using this loss function oriented to the goal of task. Nevertheless, this kind of uh, approach with triplets ha have some drawbacks, as, a, uh, as the need of a smart strategies to create these triplets, which has, uh, which has a high computational cost. So therefore, we have uh, continued investigating different alternatives uh, to train these systems, uh, taking advantage of the efficiency and the speed, and the speed of multi-class uh, training architectures. While at the same time, uh, we, we, the system is trained with a, a different uh, uh, verification metric. So uh, to develop this uh, approach uh, for training multi-class architectures, uh, we propose the implementation of an approximation of DCF as a substitute for traditional cross-entropy loss. The DCF metric is, um, is more suitable for the verification task, which is since it's inspired by one of the main verification metrics that we use to evaluate the system. And this uh, metric measures uh, the, cost, uh, the decision errors caused by uh, false alarms and misses. 
and also as in the case of the AUC, these uh, equations, theoretical equations, are not uh, non-differentiable. So we follow the, the same process using the sigmoid function to replace the binary counter. So these, uh, these expressions are the differentiable version of the previous one and, combine and doing a, a combination of them, a weighted combination of them, we have here the loss function that we are going to, to use. And you maybe ask why do it in an efficient way? Well, we calculate uh, both terms, uh, obtaining directly the scores uh, from the last layer of the of the DNN and assuming that uh, during the training in we have uh, one target example and n the total number of identities minus one non-target examples. So this assumption is possible thanks to the to the interpretation of the last layer of the of the DNN as a as um as an embedding of different speak training speakers. So the system employed to check the, the new loss function is the same as the previous uh, I previously I presented with the AUC loss, but uh, the, the main difference is that for using for ADCF loss, we only need the first architecture, but in this case, we keep the second one to compare the, the effectiveness of the method. So we can assert that uh, architecture uh, C trained with the new ADCF loss is, uh, obtains the best results, Especially relevant is the comparison with the um, is improving comparing with the cross entropy loss and the angular submax, where uh, are both uh, the most comparable uh, train with the most comparable strategy than the one that we present. So to finalize with this metric learning part, uh, we propose a, a last alternative uh, loss function to train the multi-class architectures. The previous ADCL loss, as I show, uh, has a great potential uh, to train these kind of architectures um, with a loss oriented to, to the task to minimize the DCF. However, uh, this loss uh, has also uh, some drawbacks since it's an application dependent metric and uh, needs some prior and cost parameters assumption. Um, moreover, we, we also had to, to make an approximation to be able to train the neural network. Therefore, we propose another alternative uh, verification metric that can be used um, in the same philosophy of the DCF, but uh, this metric is application independent. So uh, this other main verification metric is the log likelihood ratio cost function, and we implement it to substitute the cross entropy and also our ADCF loss to train, uh, for training the multi-class architectures. CLLR is a generalization of the DCF since it's, uh, it's uh, formulated as the integral over all the, oper all the possible operating points. So uh, this loss uh, measures the expected cost uh, of target and non-target samples. Both expressions are, are combined to minimize the CLLR as objective loss in our network. We, this expression is an analytical closed form expression uh, presented in the literature to solve the previous integral. So in this case, we, we did not uh, to make any, any approximation as we did in the DCF case. So um, to evaluate uh, this new proposal, uh, we employ the first architecture with the MC layers that I presented at the beginning. And in this architecture, we introduce the new loss function and also the previous ADCF and other loss to check the, the difference. So here to finalize, uh, this is the, the results that we obtain with the pro where we can see that the proposed objective loss outperforms uh, all the alternative loss functions uh, used to train these systems. So to finish this talk, uh, here, is, here there are the main uh, conclusions or remarks of the different uh, approaches in the two streams of research. In the first one, uh, as I mentioned several times, the relevance of keeping the phonetic information for test-dependent speaker verification tasks, especially when you have limited data, to discriminate better between speakers and uterans. And so for, for that, we, uh, we presented several approaches oriented to, kept, uh, to keep this information uh, to improve the generation of signal representations to the final verification process. And on the other hand, these kind of approaches that I presented at the beginning were not designed to optimize the verification task itself. So we also propose successful new training losses so based on the final verification metric as AUC, DCF, and CLLR. Well, 
And that's all from my side. I only want to say that I skip a lot of details and experiments. So if you are interested, you found interest in one of them, you can check in the articles that uh, they are published. And also my thesis is publicly available, so you can check more in on it. And that's all. Thank you for your attention. Any questions? I don't know. Thank you very much. I had two questions. The first was, what is the motivation or what are the kinds of applications where you would do text-based speaker verification as opposed to just plain speaker verification? And the other question is, you mentioned language verification, which I hadn't heard before. Is that different from spoken language ID? Well, for the first question, uh, well, this uh, work also started because we have a project with a company that is using this kind of test-dependent speaker verification systems for a bank application, if I don't remember wrong. And also nowadays with OK Google, you have to, to verify that are you, you saying that sentence. So it's also an important for other companies, I, I guess, <laughs> at least. And the second one, uh, I was uh, I will, uh, speaking about le the language recognition evaluation data uh, that are proposed by the NIST. So it's, uh, it's verifies if the, the utterance is from one, sp uh, one language or other. So it's the spoken language, uh, it's language identification at the same time. Thank you. And just a quick question about the attention mechanism that you use. Uh, did you try on uh, text independent verification? Because, the, well, that one question I think we already discussed with Temos in a previous presentation is the um, using this information and maybe also using uh, an attention mechanism which is not self attention but uh, coming from some ASR or some other kind of system. No, I didn't check it. I moved to other topics last summer and during the last month. So <laughs> this is was my last uh, work, and I finished at the, at the just be, just before defending my thesis last May. So I didn't check it. It's uh, an interesting thing to check. Yeah. Yeah. So I had <coughs> two questions. Uh, one was about uh, you know when you had the external segmentation followed by uh, the text-dependent verification. You're trying to do phonetic segmentation, and then later on you replaced it with this attention mechanism. Now, I was thinking that a lot of speaker-specific information is not just in the phonemes, but in fact in the phone transitions, in the diphone statistics, if you will. Do you know if your attention mechanism is using the same kind of segmentation as phonetic, or is it focusing on the transitions? Do you have any insights on what it does? I guess mm, most of the information, I guess, is in also in the way that the person is uh, speaking, so in the transitions and the onsas and the codas, but I don't check it uh, with the details. So. My other question was about DeepMind. <laughs> we were not able to get that data set in the US. How did you get it? Oh. <laughs> <I> <laughs> After a lot of problems with the network in, in Iran, <laughs> because they have some strikes and the network was down and a lot of emails with uh, a sign. Well, in Spain is... <laughs> I don't know, I just sent emails uh, with uh, Hossein and <laughs> Senali and I <laughs> achieved it. Well, I don't know if... Something is also involved with the BUT, I don't know, and so maybe it's, <laughs> I don't know, maybe this question, <laughs> he knows better than me. <laughs> Without the microphone, better, yeah. <laughs> so, questions? So, thank you again. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, thanks Marie for the introduction. Uh, my name is Pablo Jimeno from the University of Zaragoza. Um, now we're gonna change topic. Uh, we're going to mo move towards uh, multi-class audio segmentation, which is also related to the topic we are 
discussing here in our explainable decision group. Uh, what I'm going to tell today is uh, part of my PhD thesis, like just a few selected topics of uh, things that I discuss more in detail in my PhD thesis. So uh, if you have any further questions or any further uh, ideas, uh, you, can, you can also have a look at my thesis. So my, the outline for, for the presentation, I will first uh, provide a brief introduction on what is audio segmentation and why it's important and the context uh, on it. And uh, I will then dive in directly to the two main blocks that I'm going to be discussing. The first one, it's uh, some experiments we reported on uh, the use of recurrent neural networks for multi-class audio segmentation. And uh, it's uh, really convenient that Victoria here explained uh, most of the AUC optimization techniques because uh, for the second block of this uh, presentation, I'm going to be also talking about this kind of optimization techniques, but uh, in the context of audio segmentation, and in addition to this, uh, we'll be trying to expand this to the multi-class classification framework for this uh, audio segmentation uh, task. As I said, uh, this is uh, just uh, two chapters of uh, part of what I did in my PhD thesis uh, recently defended in last May. So uh, a little bit of context about the, about the, the full uh, environment. As you probably know, multimedia data is huge online. Uh, just uh, some data here. For example, YouTube has around 82 years of video content uploaded every hour. And if we have a look at uh, Spotify, for example, we, we know uh, that we have about 433 million monthly active users that can listen up to 82 million songs. So uh, data is here and it's huge. And uh, what multimedia providers want to do with this data is uh, to provide uh, value to the clients by somehow being able to analyze and catalog uh, that content. Uh, with this huge amount of data, uh, it's clear that manual annotation is uh, out of the way. It's not feasible. So, uh, uh, because of course it's expensive and time consuming. Uh, here I'm just uh, providing an example. Uh, transcribing a file can take up to four to six times of the original length of the file. This is the main motivation for part of the work I've done in my thesis and what I'm going to talk today, which is the need for automatic system that can analyze, index, and retrieve information from multimedia streams. Particularly, we're going to be focusing on audio streams, but this could also apply to any other uh, multimedia stream that you can think of. And in this context, uh, I'm introducing to, to you the audio segmentation task which uh, tries to divide an audio signal into smaller fragments according to a predefined set of attributes. Here you can see, oops, uh, sorry. <laughs> here you can see, uh, ah, here you can see an example of an audio signal with uh, three different annotations for three different classes, A, B, and C. This is just a, a, a imaginary audio segmentation system with three different classes that uh, uh, will be related to some uh, attributes that we want to uh, find in this uh, signal. So uh, this audio segmentation is a, it's basically a support, support technology that can allow the accurate application of other information retrieval systems. Uh, probably you've heard of uh, speech activity detection, which is a main uh, preprocessing block in ASR, for example, or if we want to use uh, audio enhancement, it would be nice to know, to have a, an intuition on what is the most noisy samples on this audio signal. So uh, last, uh, I want to talk about the multi-class paradigm here, and well, all in all my PhD thesis, I've been working mainly on the multi-class approach, which uh, supports only one class active at, at a given time. But uh, for example, in, in our work in the explainable decision team, we are focusing on the multi-label approach where uh, more than one class can be active at a given time. But uh, for this talk, uh, you can always think that we are doing multi-class, so we can only have one active class at a time. So this was uh, just a brief introduction and motivation to the topic. Uh, I will now jump into the first main block, which is uh, going to be about recurrent neural networks for multi-class audio segmentation in broadcast domain data. Uh, basically, my thesis has been focusing on broadcast data, and for this talk, I'm going to be talking uh, mainly on broadcast domain. So, uh, as you probably heard of uh, several well-known binary segmentation tasks, 
speech activity detection. There is also others such as music detection, the, the equivalent in music, or other binary tasks that try to separate speech and music, for, exa for example. Uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in these experiments, we are going to be dealing with a different audio segmentation task that's been designed from a multi-class perspective. Uh, mainly, we are going to be trying to separate speech, music, noise, or a combination of these classes. In these particular uh, uh, experiments, we are going to be trying uh, to, are going to be exploring the use of different RNN architectures in different variants for this for this task. Furthermore, one of the, our main our main contribution is the introduction of temporal pooling mechanism in order to remove uh, redundant information in the temporal axis. Uh, this allows to improve the performance of the system and uh, additionally reduce the uh, number of operation per second. So uh, just uh, uh, an introduction to the, but I'm going to be brief in some of the details, but if you have a question, please uh, ask uh, because I, I need to go fast on some of the <laughs> exact details. Uh, for the RNN classifier, here we propose the use of the, what we call uh, combination and pooling blocks here in between different bidirectional LSTM layers, uh, um, which uh, are described here in the next slide. Uh, we tested in three different uh, uh, variants, one that's using only the time pooling and one that incorporates also a convolutional layer in order to mix the uh, channel information and the one that only uses the convolutional uh, layer. So you have to trust me here that the one that performs the best is the time pooling. I don't have time to provide all the experiments to demonstrate this, but uh, we showed in the, in the original paper that applying time pooling in between the two bidirectional LSTM layer provides a boost in performance, while at the same time it reduces significantly the, the processing time of the, of the neural network. In addition to this, uh, in order to provide um, uh, an additional uh, inertia on the labels, we are using a post-processing module uh, implemented as an HMM uh, resegmentation. Uh, what we do here is that we model each one of the classes in the system as a state in the Markov chain, and uh, we just uh, apply this, uh, another, this other two mechanism to enforce a minimum duration of the label in the, in the inference. One of them is the RNN score downsampling using an L-order averaging filters, and uh, we use a left-to-right topology with a number of tight states for each one of the states. This, wa this way, we have uh, this uh, equation that uh, enforces a minimum duration of the lengths in the inference type. So uh, let me talk, talk a little bit about the data, how we are dealing with, uh, with the data. I want to introduce the uh, Alba Thin 2010 uh, uh, audio segmentation task, which uh, tries to separate five different classes. Here we are dealing with a speech, music, a speech and music, a speech and noise, and fifth class that we call others, which is basically silence and everything that's not been uh, described in the previous classes. As you can see, it's a multi-class approach because uh, we don't have like multi, several labels active at the same time, but we model that into different classes. Uh, this, uh, this audio is coming from broadcast news uh, domain, and we have around 87 hours of training and 29 hours of uh, test. Uh, I won't go into details in the evaluation metrics, like uh, we use segmentation error rate, which is basically uh, uh, inspired on the deionization error rate. And for the original evaluation, in order to be comparable with the original evaluation, we use the average class error. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to be presenting uh, only a subset of the results we have. Uh, I want to focus first on the feature analysis. We use a different set of features uh, in order to uh, train our systems. Uh, we saw that uh, including, uh, in addition to traditional log mail coefficients, we included chroma uh, features in order to improve the musical uh, information in the system. And we saw that uh, including this and the first and second order derivative, we saw significant improvements mainly in the classes that contain, uh, sorry, <laughs> in the classes that contain a music, like music and the speech and music class. Uh, the next, uh, the next uh, part uh, I want to talk about is the, the actual introduction of the pooling mechanism. Here I'm showing the in-depth analysis for the best performing architecture 
that is the one using a time pooling in between the first and second uh, bidirectional LSTM layers. Uh, we, did, uh, we did an analysis using both average and max pooling. And uh, as you can see, uh, while the max pooling quickly degrades uh, when using large pooling factors, we have a more or less stable performance uh, using the, the average pooling. And the good thing about these results is that we have uh, less operation per second and we have a, around a 5% uh, relative improvement compared to not using it uh, in, in our architecture. So uh, as, a, as, a, as a side part of this, uh, we wanted to remain comparable with the original evaluation. So we couldn't add any external data sources to the, to the experimental setup, but we wanted to somehow use uh, augmentation. Uh, what we came up with is using this uh, mix-up augmentation. Mix-up is a data agnostic uh, routine that can generate virtual examples through linear interpolation. So basically what we do is we get one, we get two different examples and we linear combine them using this, uh, uh, using this weight uh, sample from a beta distribution where we have this alpha mix-up uh, hyperparameter that, con that controls the, the strength of this uh, interpolation. Uh, by doing this, uh, we could uh, get another 5% overall relative improvement uh, without, ed ed <coughs> Sorry. without adding any external data in the augmentation process. Which is also interesting is that the, most, uh, the best improvement is obtained for the speech and music class, which is the class that is a pure combination of other classes in the set, the music and the speech uh, classes. And uh, finally, I want to talk a little bit about the HMM segmentation, uh, the post-processing module. Here I'm showing the relative improvement uh, observed with, the, with the applying this. Uh, we see that for different uh, hyperparameters, you're using different uh, lengths, uh, different length order in the filter, and for different number of tight states, we have, we have like a, a relative uh, stability region here around 0.5 0 0 .5 to 1.5 uh, minimum segment length, and uh, this, uh, this uh, performance decreases faster when we uh, start to increase this minimum segment length. Okay, so this was uh, the first part about the RNN. Quick question. Yeah. I was thinking about your classes. You have speech, you have music, you have noise, and you have other, right? Uh, and I guess you're dealing with, was this broadcast data? What was? Yes, it's broadcast. So are there segments news. where there is only singing without background music? And if so, what class would you give it? Only singing. Only vocal singing with no, back, no instrumentation. Is that music or speech in uh, your class? I classified? would say that's music. So, the, okay, and secondly, do you know how performance on that is? Is it better or worse than speech? Or is, are there enough examples in your test? Do you know? Uh, to be honest, I don't know. Okay, <laughs> all right. <laughs> but it's a uh, broadcast news, so okay. I wouldn't, I, you would expect like the typical jingle in news or like yeah. a music. Music is not, it's not really common in the data set. It's just, right. uh, it's less than 10% less than in, the, in the data. So it's not okay. like uh, really the most, uh, the most uh, common class. Okay. And like the typical example of music here would be like a jingle, like at the start okay. of the broadcast news or whatever. Like it's not, you wouldn't expect it to it's have- It's not a, a music radio station with songs. Uh, no, 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 it's a TV, TV news okay. uh, show. All right, okay, thanks. Okay, so for this second part, uh, uh, it's very convenient that Victoria just explained uh, <laughs> most of it, so. I'm going to go directly into what I uh, added on top of the AUC optimization techniques, which is the generalization of these uh, methods in order to be applied to multi-class classification. So uh, as uh, Victoria has, ex has explained, AUC optimization uh, uh, has some capabilities on several, not only, not only audio segmentation, but several audio processing tasks in general. But uh, due to its uh, intrinsic nature, it's limited uh, to be applied on binary task because it's how AUC works. It's usually applied in binary uh, evaluation problems. Furthermore, uh, we have uh, several multi-class segmentation tasks that pose new challenges. And we have 
increasing uh, possible error. We have several classes that can can be confused. Like uh, in general, multi-class uh, segmentation is harder than binary segmentation. And in addition to this, uh, data scarcity is even more relevant because it's harder to annotate a data set with several classes with uh, complex taxonomies. So uh, we came up with the idea of trying to generalize these AUC optimization techniques that has been applied mostly on binary segmentation tasks in order to be able to use them with an arbitrary number of classes, in order to be used them in any multi-class classification framework. So uh, some precedents here uh, before uh, before this uh, multi-class uh, uh, application framework, we've seen several AUC optimization techniques being applied in binary segmentation tasks. For example, uh, speech activity detection, or we had some work uh, on music detection uh, for uh, using AUC and partial AUC techniques. We saw that this was especially useful in limited data scenarios. And we also demonstrated that this has a showed a significant improvement compared to traditional cross entropy training. I have some this, this is uh, from uh, our paper in partial AUC. In, in addition to using AUC techniques, uh, we included uh, we, we went beyond the AUC and we tried to use partial AUC and, and other loss functions that uh, are based on uh, AUC and partial AUC. I won't go into the details because I want to focus on the multi class part. But uh, just uh, some results from this uh, paper that also show that here in red, you can see the, the red, red line is the cross entropy training. And the other three lines are AUC based uh, training, uh, training strategies. So you can see that for binary segmentation task, AUC works. And it works better than traditional, traditional cross entropy training, in this, especially in these cases with, uh, where we have uh, little data in order to train. So uh, well just a brief reminder, uh, Victoria explained it uh, very well, but just a brief reminder of what we do with uh, AUC optimization. Uh, as we cannot directly optimize the AUC expression, we are going to be using the sigmoid approximation in order to obtain a differentiable loss function. So like, uh, and the question now is, how can we go from a binary uh, AUC to a multi-class AUC optimization? So we need to first refer to the multi-class definition of AUC in the literature. So there's been usually uh, two main approaches to this, and both of them are based on the on co uh, are computed by averaging binary AUCs. The first one of them is the one versus one approach, which is shown here. I'm showing here a um, graph with the idea, where a pairwise combination of classes are used, and here, like we will get like the blue with the orange, the blue with the red, and the red with the orange, like all the possible pairwise combination of classes. And for each one of them, we will use uh, as target and non-target, and we will compute a binary AUC. Finally, all of them will be average, and that will be our multi-class AUC metric. The other approach is the one versus rest, which is bas based on a binarization solution, where we get uh, one of the classes as target, and the other classes as used and non-target. And we basically do the same. We compute one a binary AUC for each one of them. And then we average uh, all the values to get the multi-class metric. So if we know how to optimize binary AUCs, and we know that multi-class AUC can be computed as binary AUCs, then if we just plug in the sigmoid approximation and apply it a number of times on this multi-class AUC definition, we can define this uh, uh, differentiable multi-class loss function. We can do it for both versions, for, one for the OVO and the OVR versions of, the of this multi-class AUC. Uh, just some comments on the experimental setup here for this, uh, for this part. Uh, we are keeping a simple neural network setup with two layers by directional RNN. And we use the same set, set of features as in the previous experiment with a mail filter bank, a log mail filter bank, and chroma as input. For the data here, uh, we are using uh, a different one. We're using a task proposed in the OpenBMAT dataset, which, which tries to separate uh, foreground music, background music, and no music. Uh, I'm moving now to the, to the results. Uh, here, we are comparing our two AUC proposal 
with uh, a traditional softmax cross entropy training and an angular softmax. And uh, what you can see is that uh, ba basically the AUC optimization techniques uh, provide a better performance uh, com when compared to the AUC, when compared to the softmax training, both the angular and the traditional softmax. And in addition to this, uh, the OBO approach seems to be better uh, than the OBR approach in all cases. And uh, finally, uh, so some per class results. Here I'm showing like uh, the, the different performance for different classes. Uh, in general terms, same trends apply here. Like we see that the OBO approach is better than the OBR in all cases. And uh, we see some uh, boosts in performance for uh, specifically for the no for the background music class, which is the hardest class to classify. And it's also the most ambiguous class. Like it's sometimes it's hard to say this is background, is foreground, and for this class is for the class that we see like the best improvement when uh, compared to traditional uh, cross entropy training. So that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to take them. Uh, this is just, as I said, this is just uh, two chapters of my PhD thesis. Uh, it's online, so if you can, if you if you want to have a look, it's there and. It's more detail and with uh, more experiment than what I explained here. Any questions? I have one regarding the chroma features because uh, the chroma features are supposed to be related to, her, to the octaviation. Uh, so is it relevant for any kind of music? So, for example, if you have some uh, very uh, melodic music, so I think chroma is very interesting. Yes, that, that's the main use case for chroma, I guess, like for melodic music. Maybe from for something that's not melodic, it wouldn't be as good, probably. Okay, so for jingles, it could be nice. Yes. Okay. But if you have something more percussive, probably it's not the best uh, approach. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, so I, I have a question about the most confused classes. In yeah, I <laughs> had one slide with the confusion matrix, but I had to remove it in the end. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, usually, so in the in the um, in the first part, in the multi-class uh, segmentation with the uh, albicin. The most confused class was a speech that was uh, a speech with music that was mostly confused as a speech with noise, and the other way around, like mostly a speech with noise that w that was confused with a speech with music. Uh, I think that it somehow makes sense that music and noise uh, can be at some point get to be confused, like uh, is if music like it's very in the background can get to be confused with noise and it. As noise is really wide in terms of definition, like music is like um, everyone has like a general idea of what is what is music, but noise is like a more diffuse definition, so that can get to be confused at some point. But for example, in the experiments experiments with albicin, music was like the the best class, like the, with the best performance. Yeah. So um, then, what do you put in the others class? I'm curious to know what <laughs> it's are basically the others feel everything right that's not defined in the other classes. Like uh, silence, for example, is there. Like if you have like uh, pure noise, would be there. Like if you have like if you have a speech, a speech with music, a speech with noise and music, and everything that's not in these four classes is there. So you have, for example, only noise. It would be there. Excuse me, Pablo. I think I have a little bit salty question. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, uh, at at some point, I I wanted to actually use one of those models for like um, mainly semi-supervised learning and everything, and I couldn't find any online. Like, it's pretty surprising. Uh, is it like a community practice? Is it like the data sets for training are supposed to be proprietary or something? Like generally, if you go on Hugging Face, you basically find models for everything. But if you want a model for this kind of things, I find one that is pretty much undocumented. I mean, it's it's weird. Do you have an explanation? Uh, 
I can only talk from my side, and it's true that none of my models are online. That, that part you're right. Uh, I think, uh, to be honest, I think I've never seen any any of these kind of models online. Uh, I can only talk on myself, like, but, but that's a nice question. Like, probably the one who are working uh, at the explainable realization team, it will probably be online at some point. So maybe once we are done with that, you can you can try it if you want. Uh, if I could just make a comment, because I've been, I think it's because uh, supervisors are pushing enough the students. And uh, I, there are some in the room that have been pushed, but obviously not enough. So I think the community still need to push that. <laughs> so Pablo, I had a question which is not specific to what you did, but more generally, when you have these multi-class problems, I don't know what to make of averaging the areas under the curve. I'll tell you what I mean by that. If I have a binary classification problem, I know how to interpret the area under the curve, right? Because the curve corresponds to various operating points by sweeping some threshold. And you're simply saying, averaged over all operating points, what's your performance, right? That's the AUC. Now, if I do this pairwise thing, then for any one class, when it is compared with another class, the point at which it, you get a certain false alarm and misses is some threshold. But when you compare that same class with some other class to obtain that uh, false positive, false negative thing, you, you get a different threshold. So in what sense is this average meaningful? Because I don't know what to make of it. Because is it some kind of average of all operating points? I don't think so. Because each operating point is a different point on each of the AUCs, yes. each of the curves. So what are you averaging, actually? I think it serves only like a overall measure of performance like for all the classes in your data set like of course if you want to have an intuition of each one of the classes th that's mainly what i i use two different kind of metrics in my evaluation like i used obviously the auc the multi-class auc and then i had to use another like this course for the precision on recall because if i want to know what's happening in each one of the classes that's the only way to know it like but yeah it's a good question like uh I guess that m my intuition is that you can only use this multi-class AUC like a overall measure for all the classes in your set. But uh, yeah, as yeah. you said, like if you we select different <coughs> pairs of classes, like of course your threshold would be completely different depending on, on how your classes are are selected. And it's hard to get an intuition on this on, on each one of the multi-class approaches, yeah. Okay, all right, yeah. Right. I don't know whether there's a good way to interpret it, that's all. I mean, like, because like I said, I can interpret binary by saying, randomly pick a threshold, do it many, many times, and you'll get some kind of average which is reflected by the area. So if we carried out the same simulation with this system and said randomly pick many operating points, I don't even know what it means to pick an operating point because each pair has a different choice to be made. And, you know, and the system itself makes its own choices, of course. It, it has its own way of doing multi-class. So I don't know if there's a way to relate the operating points of the multi-class system with all the pairwise. I mean, I don't know, somebody should think about it. Well, uh, well technically, you could choose a set of thresholds and apply it uh, to, the, like, to all the pairwise combination of classes, and you could get more or less mm -hmm. the same uh, intuition on the AUC. But even though it's hard to relate like but that's not how the system functions right the system doesn't do pairwise things it just gives you one of a multi class layer yes yes yeah of course like when you do inference you are, you only get one of the values yeah right yeah. so so in that case what is the threshold we are sweeping and how are we getting these different in the, well in, in this uh, yeah. multi class approach what i usually do is just get a, you apply the softmax in the end and you get the rmax of the mm. of the softmax value okay. to get the the final the predicted class okay Right. Anyway, uh, we'll talk more. I still don't. I don't have a good intuition for it. That's all. Any more questions? Thank you, Pablo. Again. Thank you.